Welcome, and uh, thank you all for joining uh, tonight's event, uh, Climate, Environment, and the Politics of Public Trust. I'm uh, Kavita Sivramakrishnan, Associate Professor of Social Medical Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health, and Interim Director at the Center for Science and Society. Before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about the Center for Science and Society, as uh, one of our primary goals is really to organize cross-disciplinary conversations such as the one you will hear tonight. The Center for Science and Society brings together researchers, scholars, and practitioners in the social and medical, uh, natural sciences, in the humanities, law, medicine, and the arts in an effort to really engage in interdisciplinary research, teaching, and outreach. Our aim throughout all the years since we've been founded has been to really break down traditional academic silos, to develop new integrative paradigms for training and collaboration, and also really to do what we are doing today, which is to enhance public understandings of science in relation to some of the most pressing social concerns that we have today. We try to do this at the Center for Science and Society in several ways. We have a range of research clusters, about seven of them just now, who work, uh, who are led by Columbia University faculty, and they work on cross-disciplinary research topics that build between the sciences and the humanities. We also offer grants. The center provides seed grants for interdisciplinary projects, events, and discussion groups. And we also support grants in an effort to encourage co-taught courses between the various disciplines. And over the past five years, the Center for Science and Society has uh, has offered more than $150,000 in terms of grants uh, to various faculty, to projects and programs across the university, but also uh, beyond. We also do a lot of programming. The center organizes and sponsors and hosts almost more than 40 interdisciplinary events every year. And if you aren't already sub subscribed to our mailing list, I really encourage you to sign in so that you can be notified of all our events. Uh, all the events that we are planning this semester. And there is a link posted in the chat session of your Zoom console, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen through which you can actually subscribe to the mailing list. Now, we are also very honored to organize this event jointly, jointly with the Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health, uh, whose co-director, co Professor David Rosner, will moderate tonight's discussion. This event is part of the Center for Science and Society's fifth anniversary series. Our theme this year at the Center for Science and Society has been knowledge and access. And I really cannot think of a better topic for this Earth Day than to discuss what is necessary to increase public access, both at the global, national, and local level, to be able to understand the key issues uh, relating to climate and environmental information that really affect the health and well being of communities, both locally as well as globally. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And before I hand over to you, David, I want to share a little bit of information about how people can ask questions. And then I will introduce the panelists. If you do have a question you'd like to ask to one or all of our speakers, please send it to us via the Q, via the Q and A uh, that you can see at uh, uh, down there near your screen. And you should be able to see that feature as one of the options uh, on the Zoom screen. David and I will monitor the chat together and share your questions with the panel towards the end of today's discussion. Um, We're honored to have um, absolutely terrific speakers today evening. Uh, the first, first of our speakers that I'd like to introduce is Michael Girard. Michael Girard is the Andrew, uh, Andrew Sabin Professor of Professional Practice at the Columbia Law School, uh, where he teaches courses on environmental and energy law. He's also the founding director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. He's also a member and former chair of the, of the faculty of Columbia's Earth Institute. Before joining Columbia, he was partner in charge of the New York office of the Arnold and Porter Law Firm and is now senior counsel to the firm. He practiced environmental law in New York City full time between 1979 to 2008. Uh, he is also chaired the executive committee of the New York City Bar Association and the environmental law section of the New York State Bar Association. Mona Hanna Atisha is founder and director of the Michigan State University and Hurley Children's Hospital Pediatric Public Health Initiative, which is an innovative and model public health program in Flint, Michigan. She's a pediatrician, scientist, activist, and author. Dr. Hanna Atisha has testified three times before the US Congress. 
and has been awarded the Freedom of Expression Courage Award by PEN America. And she's been named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world for her role in uncovering, uh, uncovering the Flint water crisis and leading recovery efforts after that. Dr. Hana Atisha received her bachelor's and master's of public health degrees from the University of Michigan and her medical degree from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. She completed her residency at Children's Hospital of Michigan in Detroit, where she was chief resident. She's currently an associate professor of pediatrics and human development and a CS Mott endowed professor of public health at Michigan State University. Our third speaker is Adam Sobel. Adam is a professor at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and Engineering School. He studies the dynamics of climate and weather phenomena, particularly in the tropics. In recent years, he has become particularly interested in understanding the risks to human society from extreme weather events and climate change. And he also directs the Columbia Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate. Adam has received awards from the American Meteorological Society, the AXA Research Fund, and the American Geophysical Union. He's author uh, and co-author of more than 150 peer-reviewed articles and a popular book, Storm Surge, about Hurricane Sandy and numerous op-eds. David Rosner, our moderator this evening, is the Ronald Blaustein Professor of Social Medical Sciences and Professor of History at Columbia University and a co-director of the Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. He received his, B, uh, he received his uh, BA from CCNY, his MPH from the University of Massachusetts, and his PhD from Harvard in the History of Science. Dr. Rosner focuses on research at the intersections of public health and social history, and the politics of occupational disease and industrial pollution. He has been actively involved in lawsuits on behalf of cities, states, and communities around the nation. Uh, these lawsuits have been tied to holding the lead industry accountable for past acts that have resulted in tremendous damage to the health of America's children. Um, on that note, I'd really like to, I'm looking forward to this evening, as I'm sure are all of you, and I don't want to stand between you and a great discussion. I'd like to hand over the panel and the discussion to Professor David Rosner. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me? Is that, am I coming through? Yeah? Okay. Um, First of all, welcome everyone. Uh, this is really an auspicious moment in which to be discussing climate change. It's the 50th anniversary, of course, of Earth Day. It's the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the EPA. It's the 50th anniversary of the federal government's involvement in occupational and environmental disease in general, uh, a period of time which we've been forced by various events to really confront the impact of climate change, but confront the impact of a hundred years of industrial production on our culture, on our society, and our health. Um, I'm, as uh, uh, Kavita mentioned, I'm head of the of Public Health, which is a joint undertaking of both the School of Public Health, Mailman School of Public Health, and our history department here at Columbia. Um, its goal is really to try to merge the disciplinary perspectives of these two very, very distinct enterprises, uh, two areas that have rarely spoken to each other in the past, but we believe have a great deal to teach each other um, in the future. Um, we're meeting at an auspicious moment, as I mentioned, literally it's 50th anniversary of a pandemic of Earth Day and the establishment of the EPA. And in the midst of a pandemic that is forcing us all to confront the impact of the worlds we have built not only on our long-term survival, but on the changes of the history of industrial production that has wrought, um, wrought events that we are immediately concerned with, mainly a, uh, an epidemic. Uh, for at least the last quarter century, scientists, social scientists and climate scientists in particular, have been expecting that epidemics and pandemics of infectious disease will emerge as major threat to the world's population as shifting global ecologies promote their spread. Since at least the 1990s, a host of technical studies have identified our lack of preparation for expected pandemics. 20 years ago, the National Intelligence Estimate bluntly announced that, quote, it is not a question of whether, but when the next killer influenza epidemic will, will occur. Since then, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and other infectious 
diseases speak to the accuracy of this warning. Three years ago, the Gates Foundation and Hopkins was specific. They conducted a planning exercise which simulated, quote, an uncontrolled coronavirus outbreak that was spreading like wildfire throughout the world. Um, today, we'll begin with what will undoubtedly be an ongoing discussion of the impacts of climate change with an eye to the immediate crisis. In addition to briefly reviewing what we know, we will hopefully, after some discussion within the panel, engage in a broader discussion with you, the audience, and muse on what the future might look like. Will we once again see this pandemic as a once-off isolated event, as we did with SARS, Ebola, and other outbreaks, and simply return to the world that existed before? Will we simply open our economy and get back to work as the president and many politicians have expected, or will we use this opportunity to rethink where we want to go and what our future should look like? one that places this pandemic in a long history of climate change, industrialism, social inequalities, and unequal distribution of wealth? Should we fundamentally rethink how we got here and where we're going? We'll start in a few minutes with each of our panelists, followed by a broader discussion with all of you. Let's see how this works. I've never quite shared a uh, conference uh, without any knowledge of who's out there in the audience. <laughs> Uh, so let's get going. I'm going to start out with Adam, if, you, if you're willing, Adam. Okay, and just ask you a very broad question and let you answer it as you want, okay? Can you give us a brief overview just so we can all start on the same page of the basics of climate science and your own musings about the relationship to our experiences with public trust and our current pandemic? Yes, thanks, David, and thanks the organizers for having me. I'm going to try to share my screen now because um, I made some slides in anticipation of this question. Um, so here's some slides. Um, so I was asked, uh, charged, as you heard just now, with giving a uh, overview of what we know about climate. And since it's only a few minutes, and I think probably most people who are bothering to tune into this event know something about it, it's going to be, I'm not going to try to be in any way exhaustive or um, or thorough, I'm just gonna be a little idiosyncratic and focus on um, a few things that I think are worth saying, although there's many other things. So this first is a picture I got off of from Real Climate from a, a, a post written by Gavin Schmidt of the director of NASA GIS. In fact, I think I saw that he's online now, if I saw that in the participant list right. And what it shows is um, the Earth's, deviations of the Earth's surface temperature from its historical average and the, the lines are three different, uh, the red and the blue are two different um, observational estimates. Um, and then the uh, gray uh, uh, envelope, if you like, is uh, the ensemble uh, of predictions from uh, not the last IPCC report, but the one before. Um, so that starting in 2000, those are predictions and so the models, so in other words, there's predictions from 2000 versus what's happened in the last 20 years uh, is to the right side of the figure. And so you can just see that the models have been quite good over this period, uh, although with some spread around the truth, um, which has fluctuated up and down around the steady rising. So we know that um, the earth is warming. We know that it's due to human emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Our models can predict this. And when we say, you know, that we that we're certain that it's real, it's us. You know, these this is some of the evidence. So so we we have quite a good. There's really not a lot of uncertainty in the big picture about the fact that the planet is warming due to human influences. And there are many consequences of this. Um, various kinds of extreme events getting more extreme and more frequent: heat waves and and heavy rain downpours, uh, sea level rise. Um, I don't want to try to list them all. I'm just going to give um, first one example that's particularly germane to the United States over the last year. So this is from recent work by Park Williams um, our, from our own Lamont, uh, my colleague there. And this is a study doing attribution of uh, forest fires in the United States. So what they conclude in this study, and I won't go into the details of how they did it, is that human caused climate change over the last um, 30 years, going back from 2015, nearly doubled the area uh, 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 over which forest fires occurred. 
and so that's quite a big signal um, you know that you can take from this I think fairly certainly that the extreme fires we've been seeing in California have at least some role for human influence uh, it's by no means the only cause but there's no question that this and other fires like in Australia um, are in part caused by climate change and um, that that is happening sooner you know this is something that was predicted for a long time that forest fires would be worse with global warming but it seems to be happening quicker and worse than scientists had predicted so it's just one example of something where um, the predictions were conservative and I think that's uh, something that we're seeing in, in other aspects as well so there's a lot of things that are already happening. There's a lot of things that are certain to happen. I wanna focus on what we, for a couple of slides on what we call tail risks, which is things that are sort of at the outer limit of what um, may happen and how soon it may happen, but that, but that the reason they're scary is that we can't rule these things out. And I think we have to think of climate change from a risk perspective um, as with many other hazards. So, so one risk, for example, is that sea level rise could happen more rapidly than we have thought. So this is a paper on the left that I won't try to explain, not least because I don't have the expertise to do a good job of it, but it's arguing that, you know, bigger chunks of the of the ice sheets, in particular Antarctica, could fall into the sea sooner than we thought by complex dynamics of how the water interacts with the, interacts with the ice sheet. And if that happens, sea level could rise a lot quicker. Um, the, the graphs down there show, you know, by 2100 and over a longer period, but certainly over the next century or even out into the, the future centuries, we could see meters to even tens of meters of sea level rise, which would be absolutely catastrophic and put large areas of very populated um, land underwater. So that's um, one of the scary, sea level rise is certainly happening. It's a, we've already had about um, a better part of a foot over the last 20th century uh, globally due to climate change, but, um, and that's already dangerous, but we're gonna have more. Um, another tail risk, and this is kind of thing is really, scary. Um, this is another study that uh, argues that over the next, in, in it, within a few decades, you could have some part of, parts of the earth, especially in the Middle East um, and South Asia, where the hottest days in the year could be sufficiently hot and, and humid that people cannot survive those conditions outdoors for any significant periods of time. Now, this may not happen as soon as these studies say, um, but uh, even if it's the conditions aren't literally, don't literally become uninhabitable, they will, in the hottest parts of the world, will get closer to these conditions. And this is going to cause, um, so even if this tail risk doesn't, you know, play out in the near future, um, we could get close enough that it causes um, agri agriculture uh, failures, um, migration. And those are the way things that, about climate that really scare me is, is the, the sort of force multiplier. If you have large migrations, then that causes stresses like we've already seen. Um, in the last decade or so and wars and so on um, that are worse than climate change itself. A third one, um, I'm not at all an expert on the economics of climate change, but I will just say my impression from what I have learned is that it's even more uncertain than the physical science. Um, so this is um, from some respected economists, a, a, a graph, which I won't try to explain in detail, except that it shows some different assumptions about modeling climate and economics, different assumptions about the climate and different assumptions about how economies um, respond. And some of these curves go up. Uh, this is one measure of economic activity consumption, but some of these measures go up um, just a little bit less than they would because of climate change. And some of them go down after a few decades, which is would be economically catastrophic. So we don't know which one is right. I don't want to defend any of these, but it's just to say that the, the, the potential downsides of global warming are really, really large. Um, and, and some of the certain downsides are, are already bad enough. So I so uh, that's my short summary <laughs> of, of climate change um, of a few highlights or lowlights, if you like, um, except to say that to sort of try to connect to the policy debate, we're not doing nearly enough about this, um, even accounting for the uncertainties. I mean, even if you're optimistic, we're not doing nearly enough. So this is a picture from the more, most recent IPCC um, report, which is the special report about uh, the idea of trying to limit global warming to 1.5 centigrade um, instead of two, uh, half degree difference. And so what it shows is what you, this is carbon dioxide emissions um, on the y-axis and the x-axis is time. And so to the left of the little um, 
uh, symbol here, that's historical emissions. And if we want to stay below two degrees, below 1.5 degrees C, we have to ramp down emissions very, very rapidly. And if you made it two degrees C the target instead, it would just be a little less rapidly. And you know, I'm not, we, you don't have to be an expert in understanding the politics or economics of, of carbon emissions to know that it just doesn't look like this is anywhere near happening, right? This would, this would require, the, the future part of this would require radically, radically different behavior from what we've seen in the past. And there's no indication that that's happening. International negotiations have largely um, been a failure and our United States, uh, the United States has mostly um, not helped, the Paris Agreement being the one exception, but we now have a government that's moving us in the opposite direction. So, um, so this, and the scientific uncertainties really don't affect this. In other words, we're not close to making the kind of decisions we would need to decarbonize the economy to avoid very uh, serious, uh, dangerous warming. So just to try to say a little bit uh, about the politics of this, so why is this not happening? It's not happening in, one, Argument is that it's not happening because of climate denial, because some people just don't believe the science. Um, what you know, this book, famous book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric uh, Conway, that argues that the climate disinformation is not is motivated reasoning. It's not that people really don't believe the science; it's that they um, don't want it to be true because that would require then government action, and the people who are opposed to government action they, therefore cast doubt on the science. And we're seeing that same kind of thing with coronavirus. So lines like. Uh, you know, it's no, it's, it's no worse than the flu are sort of um, very reminiscent of things like, well, the climate has always changed naturally. So every climate person is watching this virus play out and seeing everything we've seen in climate happening, but just much, much faster and all the same kind of um, uh, misinformation. But there's one big difference that I think is kind of in interesting that's worth thinking about a little bit and that I've been thinking about. And that's that the, the large scale denial is now over. In other words, for the first couple of months when the virus was coming to the United States, we had President Trump saying it's, it's no big deal, it's gonna blow over, we don't have to do anything. And of course that delay is costing us thousands of lives. But there was a switch where even Trump and Fox News and everybody who was denying the science decided that the science was now okay, in the big picture at least. Uh, and that we needed to take some kind of action. And that's, that hasn't happened on climate. Those same people haven't made that kind of recognition on climate. And it's interesting to think about what difference that makes and what difference it doesn't make. Um, so of course it's sort of obvious why, why it's different. I mean, that the evidence is, is undeniable. You have bodies piling up, um, it's all happening much faster. And the president could see that this is gonna affect his reelection chances because his actions will make a difference in the next you know, year, which isn't true for climate. But it's interesting to think about what other differences are and what's the same. And I think, um, and this is my last slide, uh, by the way, I think what this shows us is that uh, what, what's happened since um, Trump changed his mind and decided the virus was real and not gonna go away magically was that um, it doesn't really change the underlying policy response that much or the politics that much. I mean, we, have a, we still have a pretty weak federal response that's not helping in all the ways we needed to help. The gov government isn't playing the strong role that the states needed to play. Um, and we see the Trump administration um, and, and its allies doing the same things they wanted to do anyway. I mean, uh, going after, uh, you know, trying to stop immigration and doing other things that are really irrelevant to uh, uh, the, solving the virus problem, helping the people that they want to help and hurting the people that they wanted to hurt anyway. And so I think what this shows is that that, that climate us climate people would be wise to learn is that denial is just a tactic. And even when the denial goes away, which hasn't happened on climate, but might someday, the underlying disagreements are fundamentally political and climate really isn't a science problem anymore as the virus in some respects isn't, although of course there are science problems buried in both. It's a political problem and we have to, we have to face that primarily. So I'll stop there because I think I've talked long enough and I will unshare my screen. Adam, can I just ask a very quick, naive follow-up question? Sure. Uh, I think we've all seen the New York Times articles about from space, you know, showing pictures from space about what's happened over the last, you know, month or so regarding pollution over China, over the U.S., over New York, over uh, Beijing. Um, do you think that that kind of information can help? reshape the public debate in a way that we never had the opportunity to do before. I'm, I'm, 
I'm putting an awful lot of faith in science and, and, and your ability to, for, to affect a rational discussion. But, you know, up until really even this past year, we never thought about, um, or we never accepted as legitimate arguments that Sanders raised in his election campaign. Which arguments? Huh? Which arguments do you mean? Well, the arguments, things, you know, things that now seem on the table, like- Oh, oh just all of them. Uh -huh. Yeah, just the arguments about, you know, there's the idea of tying insurance to employment. Right, right, right. It's nuts. The, you know, and now right. it's obvious, you know, this event has shown us how nuts it is to tie health insurance to right. employment. Right. Uh, you know, things that were kind of considered radical three months ago, I think are probably fairly self-evident given the economic crisis. Um, the idea of going to income redistribution and going to a four day work week, or do we have any hope of looking at that kind of basic science data and say, yeah, it makes sense to go to a four day work week. It makes sense not to have traffic clogging the highways. It makes sense for some of us at different moments to work from home rather than go into, you know, go across the country to go to a conference like this. Um, yeah. Are there any ways in which you see the impact of this pandemic in some sense reshaping the social discourse, the broader discourse, or is it just another data point, another argument that will pass next month, what if, or next year, if ever, that this specific pandemic vanishes? Well, I, I mean, I think you, you know, I, I think the pandemic uh, definitely has the potential to reshape the public discourse in the ways that you said, I mean, in, in that it's revealed the sort of weaknesses of American, uh, you know, politics and, and how our economy and how our country works and maybe some other countries as well, but certainly in the United States, I think those are, um, you know, we can certainly hope that it leads us to rethink uh, how we live and how we do things in a lot of ways. But you open by asking about the atmospheric observations of the air being cleaned up. And that I think is more problematic because um, it's not so easy to, to know how to interpret that. I mean, it's an amazing geophysical experiment. I mean, it's a, you know, if you wanna see a silver lining, it's a pretty flimsy silver lining. It's hard to take any pleasure in it, but it's an amazing geophysical experiment you know, we couldn't have done it on purpose to see what happens when you, um, you know, dr dramatically reduce uh, all kinds of human emissions of all kinds of stuff. And the air is much cleaner, but it's coming at huge costs. Um, and I don't think, you know, there is one, you do see stuff, people saying stuff like we are the virus, you know, this shows that uh, you do see people taking some kind of perverse pleasure in it. And I, I just can't do that. I mean, I think the cost of these emissions. This is not how we want to reduce emissions. You know, we don't want to do it at the cost of such great pain to so many people. So, um, you know, and 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 the carbon dioxide emissions reductions that I've seen estimates are really only, I don't know how accurate this is, um, but so the projections I saw suggested that CO two emissions may only go down a few per five percent or six percent or something this year, which is really a pretty small um, decrease considering the amount of uh, economic shutdown we had to have in order to get it. So, so I think, you know, for a lot of other reasons that you mentioned, we can hope that it'll, um, that this event will cause a reevaluation of some things that had been thought to be, um, unshakable truths in American politics, but, but the atmospheric observations, I, I don't draw as much solace from, I think they're interesting scientifically, but it's not, this is not the way to reduce emissions or to reduce air pollution, even though we can hope that we could reduce, I mean, yeah, we could all telecommute more and drive less cars. And this shows that that's possible, but this is, this is not the way or the reason we want to be doing it. Okay. Uh, well, with that little segue, I'm going to go ask Mona just to start speaking about the issue of pollution and its social ramifications and its impact on populations. Uh, I don't know if this is a natural segue, but to ask you to talk a little bit about how you see the problem of pollution and the social inequalities that feed it and uh, create diseases and unequal weights and responsibilities for um, uh, for the suffering we're going through. 
Yeah, thank you, David. And thank you to everybody. I wish I could look into people's eyes and hug people and say hello, but I think this is great what we're doing. At least we're getting together and, and sharing some information. So thank you for having me part of, as part of this panel. Um, happy Earth Day to everybody. It is um, tremendous to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And I hope it affords us all an opportunity to reflect on where we've come, our successes and our challenges and to absolutely, especially during this pandemic, envision um, a, a brighter tomorrow, especially on behalf of our children. Um, so as a pediatrician, um, a public health kind of trained pediatrician, I'm really kind of on the front lines of the intersection of kind of race, discrimination, environmental issues, um, especially as they implicate our children. Um, our children really disproportionately suffer uh, the consequences of all environmental issues and, and will and are suffering, will be the first and the worst to suffer from climate change as well. Um, I am a pediatrician in Flint, and as I hope you all know, um, we are um, about to have our, uh, in three days will be our sixth uh, year anniversary of our water switch. So in April 25th, 2014, our water was uh, changed from the Great Lakes high quality water source to the Flint River uh, without proper treatment. That um, was really driven by a breakdown in democracy, uh, by efforts at austerity, uh, and targeted towards a population that was predominantly majority minority. Um, and this resulted in a population-wide uh, lead exposure, an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease, skin issues, but really population level trauma on top of, um, on top of really decades of crisis. Um, and you really can't look at the environmental issues without looking at the health issues, without looking at the economic and the labor history um, and kind of the social injustice issues. It's all interconnected. Um, so it's it's so wonderful to be a part of a panel like this where there's so many different disciplines represented because I think one of the biggest lessons that I have learned in, in kind of my, uh, in, in the Flint story is, is the need to form these broad based teams to solve these complicated uh, environmental health, social, political issues. Um, and, um, you know, my previous hat was as a, um, a residency director, as a, as a medical educator, and every July 1st, we would welcome our new doctors. And when my new doctors came on the first day uh, practicing, and they were so excited because they had these brand new white coats on, and they were all clean, and they didn't have any stains, and you could still see the, the iron creases. Um, and one of the first thing I, I did was I was deflate their egos. I'd be like, congratulations, you're a doctor, but hey, guess what? Only about 15% of what you do in medicine really contributes to to the outcomes of, of the patients that we're privileged to treat. Um, and we, you know, we give them these hands-on lessons on, of the role of what we call in medicine and public health, the social determinants of health. That, hey, you know, where a child lives, the air they breathe, the water they drink, uh, the school they go to, the access to a safe space, the playgrounds, uh, food, all these things, um, historic issues, historic racism issues, all of these things impact the lives of our patients more than anything, any antibiotic, any Band-Aid I, I can put on a patient. Um, so that's kind of the, the lens that I have um, been privileged to work in is a lens that has had these historic injustices um, that have borne out on, on the conditions of, of people. Um, for example, in Flint, um, my kids in Flint have a 15 year life expectancy difference than kids in a neighboring adjacent zip code. And that's absolutely not unique to Flint. That, that is throughout this country, we can see the trajectory of our children um, having where their zip codes and their environment play a greater role than anything that is that is innate. Uh, and then we had this kind of egregious environmental injustice on top of that, which was our water crisis. Um, so I think it's important, um, you know, the, the story of Flint is not this kind of isolated story that happened in some kind of far away place. Um, one of the reasons that I, I wrote um, a, a book about what happened in Flint was really to share that the story is not isolated. It really speaks to the, some of the deeper crises that we're facing right now as a nation and even very much this pandemic, because the story of Flint um, is is 
has happened throughout time. It is a story of what happens when we don't lead and govern with public health at the forefront. It is a story of what happens when we disrespect science and scientists. It's a story of what happens when we also devalue and defund public health infrastructure. Um, this is the same thing. These are the same kind of um, you know pre-existing conditions that has brought us to this place with the pandemic. Um, a clear kind of um, situation of poor governance, uh, la lack of any kind of um, value system for public health, rather more for industry profits, um, a, a minimizing and a devaluing of science, scientists, doctors, um, and, and continued, continued um, cuts and disinvestment and devaluing and austerity driven measures at, at, at infrastructure, especially our public health infrastructure. So I hope we, we come away with, with learning um, some of these lessons that we've, we should have been learning really for decades. This is, this is very much um, a, an ongoing replay of public health crises that have happened throughout time. Um, but this I think has been kind of more jarring and more visible than, 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 and more vi than much of what we see in, in, envir in, in the world of kind of environmental crises. Um, so uh, for, for us in Flint um, and in Michigan, where we've also been hard hit by this pandemic, um, you touched on the issue of kind of race and discrimination. We are also seeing significant disparities in who is affected by, by this crisis, um, as well as obviously previous crises. Um, it continues to be um, our low income, predominantly minority, predominantly African-American individuals. Uh, for example, in Michigan, 40% of our deaths from this pen, from coronavirus um, are African Americans, where they only make up 14% of the population. Um, so I think it is providing us with. Um, uh, it's been eye-opening for a lot of folks who who aren't aware of the predominance of these different disparities in, in health outcomes. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to, I, I hope, um, rebuild and reconsider and and look at things like um, equity issues. Um, when we, we, we invest in these, these systems to care for each other. Um, lastly, you know, this has been such a physically um, isolating um, experience. So you look at us all on our different screens. Um, but I think there's really an opportunity for us to come away with us recognizing how, um, how connected we are um, how absolutely connected we are um, and how that we moving forward, um, we have to build on those connections rather than um, continue to put up walls uh, between us. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if Mike would be able to pick up on some of those things. Uh, sometimes we hear on the newspapers and on newscasts that you know this pandemic is a great leveler. And I think what Mona is beginning to say is no, it's not. There's disproportionate uh, effect on different populations. Uh, that's hardly a leveler it, in some sense, accentuates the, the inequalities that exist. Um, Mike, would you be able to start addressing the uh, linkage between economic inequalities and climate change and public policy? Would you be willing to talk about that? Uh, yes, and let me start by sharing my screen here. And uh, there we go. Uh, so on a global basis, there's a shocking disparity uh, between uh, in, in, in who is consuming um, uh, the resources that are leading to greenhouse gas emissions and, and who are the victims of greenhouse gas emissions. So what this chart is showing is that the top uh, uh, 10%, the, the richest 10% of people in the world are responsible for almost half of the uh, uh, CO2 emissions that are um, uh, stem from consumption. And, and actually the top 1% uh, are disproportionately uh, responsible for the top 10%. And so we, we have the, the richest 10% of the people in the world who uh, cause um, uh, half of the emissions, the poorest 50% are responsible for only about 10% of the um, emissions that are caused by consumption. Some particular examples of that, uh, air travel, 
Of course, it's the wealthiest people who uh, who fly airplanes and airplane fly in airplanes, and those are the uh, those are significant sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Another important source of greenhouse gas emissions is the, is meat consumption, and around the world we see that it's the affluent countries that on a per capita basis consume a lot more meat. So in lots of different ways, it's the uh, richest people who are responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions, but the most vulnerable people by far are the poorest people in the world, uh, the people whose livelihoods depend on agriculture and therefore are highly sensitive to, uh, to weather extremes, or people who live in, in river deltas in, the, uh, in, in South Asia or the Mekong Delta or the Nile Delta, the people who are most susceptible to uh, to extreme flooding, the people Adam mentioned ex extreme heat, parts of the world that may be vulnerable to unbearable heat uh, in the uh, in the years to come. Uh, the poorest people uh, in many parts of the world, including the U.S., are also mo most likely to live near the sources of pollution, the power plants and the freeways and so forth, and so they are the victims of this profound environmental injustice. And, and that is very similar as, as Mona was saying to who are, who's most vulnerable to the COVID-19 virus. It's the, the, it's the poor people who live in crowded conditions. They can't observe social distancing. Uh, uh, they are more likely to, if they have jobs, to have to go to work because they're the, they, they drive the buses or they stock the delivery, they, they, they stock the grocery stores or they uh, are the delivery people are, all, they don't have the luxuries of, of working at home uh, and, um, and being distance, uh, uh, distant like that. And as Mona said, uh, in many cities around the country, it's been shown that a shockingly high percentage of the deaths from the virus are African-Americans, a very disproportionate uh, percentage. Now, let me mention this, uh, um, a matter, uh, David, that you raised with, with Adam about the effect of the pandemic on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I've seen the same figures as Adam, the uh, predictions that the current crisis will lead to something like a five or 6% drop in global um, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, which is a uh, very, very small contribution to solving the climate problem, not the way we want to solve it. Uh, but um, according to the UN emissions gap report, in order to be at a 1.5, stay at a 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, uh, warming, we would need to be reducing uh, emissions seven or eight percent per year each year uh, for at least the next decade. And so this, this is similar to one of the charts Adam showed, the, the, uh, the kind of drop in greenhouse gas emissions we would need in order to be on a 1.5 degree scenario as opposed to the business as usual uh, scenario. And, and the, the, the final important point I want to make is for that to happen, we need the law. Now I'm a lawyer saying that, but um, uh, this kind of drop is not going to happen as a voluntary matter or because of uh, just technological developments. And the fact that this is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is, allows us to establish that because Earth Day in 1970 uh, kicked off the great decade of environmental lawmaking in the United States. Uh, the uh, Clean Air Act was uh, signed into law a few months after the first Earth Day. In 1972, we had the Clean Water Act. That decade, we also had the Endangered Species Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And almost all of the environmental laws that we work with today were enacted in that decade after Earth Day. And they worked. They absolutely uh, achieved reductions in the pollutants that they regulated. So just one example of that is this is uh, emissions of, uh, uh, or this is uh, uh, concentrations, airborne concentrations of carbon monoxide in the Western states of the United States from the period 1970 through 2018. And they just plummeted from very unhealthy levels. This is the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. This is considered sort of the safe level. They just plummeted from very unhealthy to healthy as a 
direct result of these laws, particularly the Clean Air Act that were enacted in the wake of the first Earth Day. We don't have that for carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide has not been regulated by any of these environmental laws. And so with, uh, with carbon dioxide, uh, these are, this is what, so the levels have been back to uh, 1990, even before 1990, they, they were lower. And the drip was not because of any, the, the drop here was not because of legal requirements. It was mostly because uh, fracking made natural gas uh, abundant and cheap and substituted for a lot of coal. Uh, this is what President Obama promised to get us to by 2025, but President Trump is backing off on that. Without law, we're not going to see anything approaching the kind of drop that we saw. And th this is emissions in terms of concentrations in the, in the atmosphere. This is what's happened to concentrations in the atmosphere uh, because it's all cumulative because the CO2 stays that, there for a long time. Uh, so it was, uh, it, it was the law that made the emissions drop and it was the social movement that was crystallized in Earth Day that caused the law to be enacted. And that's what we need now. Oh, thank you. Um, well, this is very depressing. If we could, given the political environment, the idea of getting a law passed right now seems pretty, pretty bleak. I mean, a regulatory law. Uh, but you're absolutely right about what happened in the 70s, this incredible activism, uh, awareness of the environment led to you know, these enormous changes that were seem to have been slowly being attacked and reversed. Um, this leads me just to a general question for everyone. Um, and I'm a historian, so I tend to look back and try to figure out who's responsible for the mess we got in. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you go about evaluating that responsibility without the history? Um, uh, do we, do we just accept that this is an inevitable crisis or can we see it kind of akin to, akin to the epidemic of 1348 where feudalism basically was stabbed in the heart by the, you know, the plague uh, where it just broke down a basic system forced not, a, not a conscious reevaluation but a reorganization of society that destroyed the the old feudal system. Um, is there a way of seeing this, and this is really the very, very hesitant silver lining that um, uh, you know, I raised at the beginning, as a kind of transformational moment? Um, is there a way of mobilizing the kind of new understanding to basically one, accountable in a way we never have before? Or are we just doomed to pass this by and await the slow disintegration of our ecology and our economy and our society um, as, we watch, as we watch the tides rise? Um, you know, is there anything we can get out of this that will give us a glimmer of hope? Anybody willing to tackle that? <laughs> I would say that the stakes of the November election cannot be overstated. Um, that if, if Trump is reelected, then we'll continue on this slide and we'll continue with the fossil fuel interests being the most favored part of society and no hope of, uh, of, of adequate action. We'll have a lot of action at the states as, as we do now, but it, it won't be enough if, if uh, if, if he's defeated and we have a democratic president, uh, the regulatory state will come back, we'll have more regulations. It is possible that we will have legislation. Uh, there, a, a carbon tax is a possibility. And, and one of the fundamental issues is that dumping all this stuff into the atmosphere has always been free. And therefore in the capitalist system, there's no inducement uh, to restrain your unregulated, unpriced emissions. It is possible um, that uh, depending on how the election goes, both with the White House and Congress, that we'll see a carbon tax that will begin to internalize the externalities of these emissions and begin to correct it. Whether it'll do it at any where approaching the pace we need, I don't know, but it would be an immense 
change and a move in the right direction. Great. Well, that's a, that's so full. Kavita, do you want to uh, take over and just start addressing some of the, seems like there are about yes. 90 people on chat, a few people on q and I don't know how that's organized. Yeah, so I, I wanted to articulate one of the questions we got, I think it's to all the panelists really. Um, and it picks up from what uh, Michael was just saying about the elections and politicians. So one of the questions we, uh, we've received is about how do we educate mass populations when politicians brazenly do propaganda of extreme denial. So what are the kind of strategies we would have in case the elections don't change what we think will change? And uh, in case we are left with the status quo as it is, I mean, how do we begin to uh, do advocacy, I think is the question. I can start by trying to answer that and also kind of pivot to the last question as well. So I am wearing a t-shirt from Earth Day from when I was in high school where a group of young kids got together and shut down an incinerator. And at a really, really early age, I um, recognized the connection between environment and health and um, civic engagement. We elected a, a legislator who put in a law that said you cannot operate an incinerator so close to an elementary, uh, to an elementary school. It was literally in the shadows. Um, and that has stuck with me since. Um, and some a, a really big lesson from that moment was also the power of youth activism and youth engagement. And that, especially as a pediatrician, gives me so much hope. Because if you look at the climate change and environmental movements right now, a lot of, action and really unprecedented action has been led by our children um, and our children of, from so many different countries representing so many different kinds of populations in Flint we have this amazing girl named Little Miss Flint Mari who has done more in her 12 years of life than most um, adults have. Uh, an hour ago I was on a phone call with this amazing 12 year old kid um, you probably um, know this child um, Levi Durham who's part of the Juliana lawsuit um, suing the government um, for climate change. So I am absolutely hopeful and inspired by the engagement and the activism, especially of our young people. And I think that is how we counter the denials um, and kind of the lack of action. I wish we can give the young people the power to vote because like these 12 year olds like should be voting. Maybe that would make a difference. Um, but we have to vote on their behalf and we have to get engaged on their behalf. But we also have to kind of um, step back and elevate their voices because these issues, especially climate change issues, it is their generation and their children's generation that will absolutely be most impacted by what happens. Um, so I am hopeful, I am optimistic. I think we need to continue um, all kinds of efforts of engagement and activism um, and elevate and continue to elevate diverse voices. Fantastic, what a great way to segue to questions from the audience. Kavita. Um, so we have another question, which is um, that methane emissions are more potent than CO2. Should meat consumption be more talked about? What is the law, law you want to see implemented, Michael? Well, I think that an adequate response to the global climate issue would have to include a very significant decline in, in meat consumption, especially beef, which is the, the, the most energy in, in inefficient. The, problem is that it's difficult to envision any parliament or, or legislature adapting enacting laws on that because it is such a cultural issue. I, I can't conceive of a US law that would overtly restrict meat consumption. So I think this is more a matter for cultural change than it is for legal change. It was a cultural uh, change that did more than anything else to uh, reduce tobacco use. Law played a role, but I think we had a we had a, a shift in the culture, and I think we need that for uh, meat as well. I just can't imagine the law stepping in in a serious way. Great. Um, the other question we have is: How can turning to a localized economic system um, affect reaching the emission goals? Can you speak on the effects of globalism and corporatism, corporatism, corporatism in regards to CO two emissions? and the direct impact on impoverished and environmentally precarious communities like at Flint. I'll say that international uh, uh, trade, that, that shipping and international air travel 
uh, together amount to about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. If they were a country, they'd be about the seventh largest country uh, around the size of Germany. So it's a very substantial uh, portion of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, it has led to prosperity in, in many ways of the around the world, profoundly unequally shared prosperity, uh, but in terms of the overall uh, um, uh, GDP of the world, if you don't count the negative externalities, it has led to a great uh, increase. Uh, I certainly think that the, the crisis is going to lead to probably a long-term reduction in air travel. Uh, I don't know that it'll have much effect on shipping traffic. Uh, that's a whole different uh, phenomenon. Mona, do you want to uh, respond to that also? <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is kind of a part of Flint's history and part of the history of many of our post-manufacturing communities. Uh, you know, we built highways and to, to extract wealth and we took them out to the suburbs um, and we left the, the communities um, you know, exposed to kind of the, the consequences of that manufacturing. Um, so it's not just kind of corporatism, but it's capitalism and it's greed that have really disproportionately impacted vulnerable populations um, like Flint and, and created uh, segregation, um, but also unequal um, health and environmental quality. Adam, did you have something to say to that or should we move to the next question? Well, I, I'm trying to formulate something that's related to this question as well as the previous ones. You know, I, I think that, um, first of all, in response to the previous, I, I agree with everything uh, Mona and Michael said so far, especially about the youth uh, movements. And, and I think, you know, the, the original question a couple of questions ago, I'll get to the current question in a minute, but the one a couple of questions ago was about how do we um, educate people given when the politicians are doing denial. And I think, to sort of amplify what Mona's response to that question, which was I agreed with everything she said, is that I think we have to understand that, I tried to say this in my opening remarks, but I think that the, the denial that we're hearing from the politicians is really a smoke screen. In other words, most of the, the, the politicians who say climate change isn't a problem, I don't think they really believe that. I think there's a lot of evidence that very few really believe that. It's just that they don't, you know, it, what, what we're looking at is, a, is entirely opposing worldviews about how the world should work. I mean, when scientists say, well, if we don't reduce emissions, these things happen, these things will happen, and these many people will die, what the politicians who deny the science are really saying is not we don't believe the science, but we don't care. I mean, if those people die, it's okay with us because it's not gonna be us and it's not gonna be the people we care about. And so, or it's not as important as other short-term you know, goals we have, um, political and, and economic. And so, you know, I think, What's great about the youth climate movement um, is that I think they've recognized that and framed it that way. I think a lot of my generation, certainly a lot of scientists in my field have, have framed it as a science issue that you guys don't respect science. Here we are the scientists, we're stating what the facts are and you're not listening to us and that's the problem. What the um, merchants of doubt showed is that that really isn't true. It's a manufactured uh, denial for um, for political reasons. And so we should, to some extent, stop arguing about the denial and recognize what the root disagreement is, which is a political one about who matters and what kind of future we want to have. And so that's the way the political thing should be claimed. It shouldn't be about do people believe in science or not. It should be what kind of future do we want? And I think that that's, you know, the youth movement is framing it that way, but that's relatively new. In other words, we're framing it as a social justice issue, not a science and environment issue. You know, I think the original Earth Day, in some way, one of its negative side effects was it sort of splintered off a group of people who cared about the environment that, that are envisioned as sort of hikers wearing Birkenstocks or something, and it's an issue for those people. The youth movement is saying, no, it's an issue for everybody. And so to get back to globalism, I mean, one aspect of globalism is that we have trade and airplanes and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing is, do we care about people who live far away from us or don't we? You know, so there's this, this, this nationalism you know, nationalist populist movements that are emerging now in so many countries, including the United States, that's as opposed to the view of, well, all human beings matter and we care about them even if they're not our, you know, uh, family members or, or whatever uh, uh, of our religion or our speak our language. And so I think, um, you know, that's the part of globalism that we have to keep because climate really is a global problem. You know, my emissions are this, I mean, I may emit more or less than somebody else. As Michael showed, I'm probably emitting more than most people on the planet, but 
you know, but all the emissions get mixed up together and everybody's gonna suffer the consequences to some degree, even though wealth can protect people a lot. So, I mean, I think that's the part of globalism that we wanna keep, you know, it, it is the recognition that, you know, once somebody crosses a border, they don't become a fundamentally different human species of human being. Has anybody else uh, read this book by Walter Streak? It's called um, How Capitalism Will Fail. And it's kind of a, a kind of a dismal history of the last hundred years. And his basic, one of the basic hypotheses in the book or points of the book is that there was once a bunch of robber barons that raped the earth and did horrible things, but they were also worried about the social impact of that, of their changes, uh, because they depended upon workers to run their factories in a classic Marxist sense that they depended on them and they were worried about the social disruptions that would occur. And he said the difference between that generation of rapacious warlords and the contemporary rapacious warlords is that this generation of owners and factory managers and people who have an interest in upon a class and a group of people that have lost power that they've had, whether it's automation, it goes through a whole series of changes in the economy that allow this group to feel as if they're insulated. I mean, he's not talking about a literal group, but you know, whether it's be, the whole construction of the modern economy has insulated certain powers that have a real profit in the rapaciousness of the culture and do not fear the impact of the instabilities that will be created if that culture very depressing book because it doesn't really give you a option it's not like the old kind of 1960s when i was a kid marxist analysis which always started out yeah capitalism's going to fail but there's always socialism at the end so to speak you know there's always something awaiting that will improve us in that. So therefore, if Wall Street blows up, so what? You know, that, that part of that, that culture. This was, yeah, capitalism will fail, but there's nothing afterwards. Uh, impressed by that. I don't know whether anyone's seen that book, but to what degree do you think that what you're painting, Adam, is kind of a similar picture in which this group feels that they don't really have um, any any counteracting force that's going to affect them. Uh, do you think that that's, is there any truth in that? I mean, when you're speaking, that book came to mind. That's... Yeah, I mean. Uh, well, that's depressing. That's true. And, and the interesting thing is how, I mean, the other interesting thing is, is you know, the, the you know, the, the, we have a media system where, I mean, we still have a sort of a, quasi-functional democracy for the moment it, in the United States, maybe, um, although threatened. But I mean, somehow, so somehow the there's a lot of people who share this worldview, even though they're maybe not quite as invulnerable. I mean, it's this combination of people who feel that the problems in the world don't affect them and other people who feel very much affected by um, the problems in the world, but have been convinced of solutions that I think most of us in this event would probably think are not the right solutions. So, I, mean, I think oh. you guys both you guys both made me think of another book, um, and I think David, you've read this book as well. It's um, by David Michaels, former director of OSHA, The Triumph of Doubt, which really kind of um, chronicles the playbook that has been followed by industry to instill doubt in science, starting from the sugar industry in the 1930s, going through kind of lead and coal and climate change uh, uh, to the present day. Um, but also um, kind of like Adam said, not as much they deny the science, but they have these fancy PR campaigns and corporate lawyers to for the end game of the ideology of limiting regulations and maximizing kind of corporate profit. So I think for me, it was a really kind of eye opening book of you know, why, why we're in this kind of reactionary rather than proactive public health, you know, uh, system where we're also tr always trying to, 
you know, strengthen regulations, but there's always people pushing back. So I, I think it, it, it helps understand some of these kind of differences in worldviews and ideologies and, and how they are um, operationalized. Can I quickly jump in with two, um, two questions we've got? I'll kind of club them together. Um, the first is really, I mean, how do we, how can we better translate science? That it's often quite intimidating for the common person and we need actors who can translate, translate these facts to a larger population. And then the second question is that maybe, is the pandemic really an opportunity now to talk about the health impacts of climate change that are now much more intuitive and apparent um, to the public? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I can start. I mean, the, the first question is a question that I simultaneously uh, like and dislike. I mean, on the one hand, I think it's true that so many scientists are not great communicators to the public. And that's because in our training, we learn how to communicate with each other uh, over years of hard work. And then we have to unlearn the habits uh, in order to communicate with the public because it's very different to communicate with a peer who shares all your training and understanding and you're only arguing over the details versus communicating with the public who doesn't have all that training you have to you know be use plain language uh you know connect through shared human you know understandings you have to do a lot of things so all that is true and i think it would be great if scientists would learn to be better communicators and as well uh um you know, support the many communicators of science who are not professional scientists. I mean, there's a lot of great uh, communicators about science who are not working scientists, and that's fine. I guess what I challenge about the question, though, is, is the sort of implicit understanding that that's really the root of any of our major problems. In other words, I don't think we have fundamentally a science education problem. I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding of science out there, but I think the real conflict here is a political conflict over values and the science uh, disinformation is a smokescreen, I think. So, I mean, science communication is great, but I, I, I just, um, I, I just don't think it's uh, the issue. And apart about the whether the um, the coronavirus will help us understand climate, I don't know because I don't think there's that much evidence that the coronavirus is really a, a manifestation of the climate problem. I mean, it's a manifestation of a lot of other things. I mean, humans encroaching on wildlands and, and uh, mass agriculture and other things that are reasons for lots of emergence of new viruses. Mona's probably more an expert on it than I am. But I mean, except in some sort of cosmic sense where people become more aware of global problems and sort of remote threats um, and or rethink our, you know, rethink everything. I mean, maybe it'll help, but I don't. Right now, it seems almost to work the opposite way because Coronavirus has taken over everything, so it's hard to really think about other problems for some many of us. Yeah, let me say I, I agree that I don't think it's overall an education issue. The the Yale program on climate communications does extensive studies, which have, as I understand it, have not shown a direct correlation between educational level and belief in climate change. Uh, it's that the people who are better educated who don't believe in climate change are better at coming up with rationales for not believing in climate change. Uh, so so I, I think there it is a much deeper cultural issue than educational level. Mona, do you have? Yeah, I guess I would just say that I think in our scientific and academic communities, we, we should be ingraining more opportunities to allow us to be better communicators. Um, so for example, with my, my trainees, my medical doctors, um, we do like advocacy trainees, we do role playing, role playing on how to talk to legislators and how to prepare fact sheets and how to write op-eds and all these things. And I was a privilege to have gotten that kind of training in, in my career. Um, but I think we need, we also do need to do a little more with that. You know, we're really good at writing articles and journals that very few people read. Uh, we have to also train um, academia to write in op-eds and to write lay person books and to, to you know, do interviews and all these other things that will um, reach a lot more people. Right. So there's one more question, which is about polarizing and less polarizing technologies. What is the potential of less polarizing technologies and policies associated with those such as cool roofs and tax breaks associated with their use for addressing climate change? I thought you were going to say like Twitter is a polarizing technology. <laughs> yeah. well, there are a lot of measures that both create jobs and do not inflict overt pain. I mean, a lot of energy efficiency measures, uh, for instance, uh, 
reduce consumer um, electricity or fuel costs and, uh, and can create jobs depending on how they're done. And so I think that those are not intrinsically polarizing technologies and they will be very helpful. I think that the construction of, of renewable energy, we need a massive amount of wind and solar uh, uh, projects built. And there are some people who don't like them, but most people don't mind. Um, and those are also uh, uh, sources of potential a great economic opportunity, tax revenues for the places where they go. Lots of jobs can be created. So I think that uh, that kind of uh, green infrastructure program can really be positive and a best case scenario for emerging from the current um, uh, crisis is that the is that we see uh, something like the Works Product Projects Administration. We see something like the Depression Era public works programs aimed at building out a green economy and a resilient uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, in a best case scenario, we would see a lot of public money going into that, and it would be solving several, uh, killing several birds with one stone. So there's a question that's following up on some of the observations the panel has made. Uh, my questions follow up on Adam's points about needing to recognize fundamentally ideological differences between climate deniers and environmental activists. To what extent does the panel think that we need also to make palpable the extent to which globalization has essentially outsourced pollution? Just as better labor standards, standards in the US have been evaded by corporations that can open factories in China in order to continue to make products cheaply. And um, as a result of that, uh, coal pollution and other things have been affected. Can you rephrase the question part of it? What was the uh, question? Well, the question is basically about, you know, what is the place of these ideological differences that you talked about between climate deniers and environmental activists? And what has been the role of globalization in the fact that basically, if we don't want to talk about pollution in one space or in one country, basically, we are outsourcing it to other spaces. And what do we do about that kind of inequity? We've talked about, Mona has been talking about certain spaces of deep inequity, but how do we relate that globally? I think that is a very valid point, which I don't see having much salience in terms of public opinion. I think it'd be hard to persuade a lot of people to care deeply about that, even though it is very important. That, that's my instinct. Right. I mean, it's true that even, I mean, when we think about carbon emissions, um, the, the simplest way of accounting for them, I mean, let's imagine we were to have serious climate negotiations, uh, you know, with good faith from all nations. Um, the, the most naive and common ways of accounting for carbon emissions to focus just on carbon emissions um, don't really account for that. In other words, you know, if Australia, um, you know, if one country mines coal and somebody else burns it, mm -hmm. um, the people who burn it get the emissions on their tab and the people who mined it didn't, except for the emissions they burned in the act of mining it. Mm -hmm. Although of course there's ways and of, of accounting for that and people who do it, but it's um, it makes things much more complicated to recognize that and even more um, challenging when you think about all the other kinds of pollution. So the question is spot on and I, I'm trying to think of why we were all so silenced by it. Um, but I think it's because it's, um, it's even harder than some of the other ones were, mm -hmm. we're talking about. Mona, do you have anything? Internet, to... Let me just say the international system of climate regulation only is considering the production emissions, the emissions at the place where the uh, pollution is created. It, uh, so if the U.S. imports goods from China and, and the goods from China are made using coal from Australia uh, and Americans consume it under the, uh, under the uh, climate regime, uh, those are the emissions of China. The, it's not counting where the fuel comes from and it's not counting where the goods are produced. I guess I would just add, you know, being a pediatrician in Flint and kind of going through our crisis and caring for our children, um, it's, it's made me realize how, you know, my kids in Flint um, 
you know, they don't have the same opportunities as kids elsewhere. Uh, for them, they don't, you know, it's almost as they don't have a chance at that American dream that's been afforded to so many other children. And it's the same situation everywhere. Uh, people close their eyes to Flint and they close their eyes to Flint kids and they close their eyes to children all over this country. And I think it's hard for me to see us as a nation that opens their eyes to kids in other countries where we don't do a good job opening our eyes to kids who are suffering disparately here. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is part of a large, our industry is and it's in some sense reflective of the way, you know, the previous point about Streak's book which is, you know, we used to have, I'm thinking of Flint and I'm thinking of Michigan and I'm thinking of Detroit. We used to have large areas in which we could specifically identify the source of a problem. Workers would talk to each other in the 1930s and say, we're getting screwed. You know, we're gonna go out on strike and sit down in Flint. We're gonna go out and strike and go to Red, you know, River Rouge. We're gonna act. But one of the geniuses of the factory system has been, and you know, uh, I guess Streak might argue, and I might argue, is that they dispersed the means of production. They they took Chicago, I mean, they took Detroit and gutted it, and distributed factories first around the country in smaller communities where groups to, who wanted to organize and talk about these issues. You know, the youth of today uh, paralleled in 1930s um, could not even communicate with each other. They, ha they managed to figure out a system in which the union movement could not draw on 10,000 people at one time and assert its authority. And in some sense, the internationalization of petrochemicals, the movement of lead from, you know, Missouri, for example, to Peru you know, lead mining or the movement of the petrochemical industry from, you know, the industrial, you know, the industrial heartland to God knows where um, has in some sense cre helped create that disparity, the disappearance of community power. Um, and you're holding out, I think Mona's holding out the idea that there really is other, there are other constituencies that this global economy has created that are really at the root of possible change that we have not historically thought that we've thought about, um, which are you know the the kids. So we have a question about the price of oil. How will the price of oil pay, play out? Will it be used to keep it at the ground as unviable, and a movement towards renewables could be mo could be moving forward more aggressively? How can we make sure that it stays the way it is instead of, uh, or will it be used uh, to subsidize fossil fuels for an economic bounce back? I think this is a this is straight on. It's a good question. So, so I'll start, if I may. In the in a usual world, a very low price of oil would mean a lot of people would go out and buy gas guzzling cars. They would go out and buy uh, SUVs. Uh, but of course, right now, people are not feeling affluent, and so they're not uh, doing that. It would also be, uh, discourage uh, renewable energy. Uh, but most of the renewable energy, wind and solar, is to make electricity, and oil is not used to make electricity in this country anymore. So they're not really in direct head-to-head uh, competition. I think that the uh, remarkably low price of oil will drive out of business a lot of the small companies that are engaged in fracking because they, they can't make any money with, with oil so, so cheap. And I think that actually is one of the things that Russia and Saudi Arabia had in mind in, in this very strange price war that is, uh, that is going on. Uh, in a rational world, uh, we would say that it now makes it much easier to impose a, uh, a tax on gasoline because if gasoline is so cheap, a little bit extra money isn't going to hurt the uh, uh, money at the pump is not going to hurt that much. And in a rational world, when we are facing uh, very large government deficits, this would be a terrific opportunity to get rid of the fossil fuel subsidies, which are very important in the U.S. and around the world. But I'm not arguing that we are in a rational world and any of that will happen. So it's very tough to figure out what will be the long-term environmental consequences of the current oil glut. I'll just say there was a Trump tweet the other day 
that foreshadowed a, a attempt that most, you know, that we can expect some further, uh, some kind of fossil fuel industry bailout proposal to come from his administration. We haven't seen that yet, but there was a tweet. So we have another good question here. Mona, did you want to add to that or shall I move to the next? Okay. Has, uh, has the coronavirus allowed us to do what we thought was the impossible experiment of reducing emissions for a prolonged enough period of time to see the effects of human activity on climate, but haven't been able to, but haven't been, but haven't we also done the social and economic experiment now and seen the social and economic cost of a severe reduction in carbon-based human activity, especially on vulnerable populations? Yeah, I would challenge both the premises of that question. Um, in the first place, I mean, the, the carbon emissions, you know, assuming this thing is so over in a year or two or less, mm -hmm. um, you know, the reduction in carbon is not going to be enough for us to see any large climate, you know, change in the trajectory of the Earth's climate because it's just not, doesn't look like that huge enough reduction won't be sustained long enough. And the time it takes for, uh, you know, there's so much variability in the system. You, I just don't think we'll see it um, in any substantial way. We're seeing huge impacts in air pollution because that's shorter lived stuff. And so we're seeing, you know, much, much cleaner air. But but the part that that I, I really disagree with is the, the contention that seems in, implied by the question that, that this is the way carbon emissions will or should be reduced. I mean, the whole goal of any reasonable climate policy should be to reduce emissions more than this with much less attendant suffering. I mean, you don't want to do it by shutting down the economy. You want to do it by decarbonizing it. Um, and, you know, whether we can do it fast enough and at low enough cost uh, for whatever, you know, criteria we want to set as, you know, is, is something that the experts and anybody else can debate. But, um, but I don't think this tells us, I don't think this kind of catastrophe has to be associated with um, reductions in carbon emissions as big as we're seeing or even much larger. Can I ask why we don't think about doing two together? I mean, we're talking about the experiment, the human experiment with climate change due to, or at least air pollution. Um, why aren't we ever thinking about doing things like redistributing wealth through the reduction of the, you know, reduction of the work week, allowing for a much lower output of carbon, carbon dioxide. I mean, why are we separating out the economic consequences um, from the, the scientific reality? You've okay. just articulated the rationale for the Green New Deal, as I understand it. Well, that's, you know, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, why aren't we thinking about that? Well, I mean, it depends who we is, but I think we are. I, guess okay. what I just heard you saying that the costs of actually reducing carbon, the carbon footprint is too great. No, no, I, I meant to say the opposite. I meant to say the way it's being done now by having a coronavirus that shuts down the whole economy at a, at a, with a benefit of a 5% reduction in carbon emissions, that's not the right way to reduce carbon emissions. The right way is to do it consciously through, uh, you know, means that bring economic benefit to the largest number of, of people um, rather than harm. Okay. This, this is not, the coronavirus is not a well-designed carbon mitigation program, but <laughs> no. a well-designed program could exist. Okay, good. And is being proposed, I think. Thank you. And only a relatively small portion of the overall national electorate would go along with that, uh, uh, with that approach, uh, the approach, David, that you're suggesting. Right now. I mean, but I can see, you know, kind of a movement of, to address the inequality that Mona talks about, the, the climate crisis that Adam's talking about, and the regulatory issues that you're talking about. It seems to me like there is a, a way of mobilizing those three Kind of parts of the uh, of the puzzle, um, if we could kind of mobilize certain populations. That's why I was kind of like turning to Mona for hope, you know, in terms of her identification of young people who could understand this issue as not just a one-off pandemic, 
that's happening. And then we go back to quote normal as the president talks about it. You know, we go back to the life we lived 12 months ago, um, which was deadly. And we all knew it in the long run, but this pandemic has brought, it can be used, I mean, hopefully used as a mechanism for identifying what we have done to ourselves, irrespective of whether we're dying immediately. Um, but wh what is required to really create a stable new environment that does not, uh, is not ravenous. Um, so I was trying, hopefully, you know, to kind of say we all are talking about the same kind of fun, in some sense, very fundamental change that's required and trying to pose the idea that there is a program that could actually attract people. And we just, you know, the issues like, uh, you know, that Sanders identified in the campaign, which seems so radical a year ago, you know, so radical, the idea of universal health care, because, you know, that is now obviously absolutely on everyone's mind, but, you know, and the idea of divorcing universal health care from the job and from employment, I think is probably something that people would really understand in the course of this current epidemic. The idea of taking away health care at the very moment when millions of people are going on, um, are losing their insurance is, is, idiocy. So I'm just thinking about the ways we could work out a program that was a little less depressing. Do people want to respond to that? There is a last question which actually captures uh, in, in, in a line what David is trying to ask, I think. Uh, what action for you, all panelists, could be more, could be the most effective to protect the environment? So if all of you had one go at saying what would be the most effective action to protect the environment, what would that be? Go to swing states and register voters. <laughs> that's, that's the immediate, immediate answer, yes. Vote, I was gonna say vote, same thing. Vote, get others to vote. The same thing and, and how did, it, but it's interesting to think about how to do that um, at a time when nobody's supposed to be outside. All of you New Yorkers need to move to Michigan. Um, we need you uh, very, very much of a swing state. But we can't go knock on doors anyway. No, you can make phone calls. You can uh, chain, move here permanently. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mona. <laughs> Love your winters. <laughs> well, I think it's getting, it's right on time. I think maybe unless there's some, you know, burning questions out there. Uh, I really want to thank everybody for getting together. This is wonderful. Um, you know, I know some of you individually, but um, getting us all in the same room was a lot of fun. A lot of fun for me and very interesting. Thank, thank you. you for organizing this. Well, I didn't organize it. That was good yeah. thank, thank you. And thank you on behalf of the Center for Science and Society, Center for the, uh, the Center for the Ethics and History of Public Health, um, and uh, to all of you, especially for joining us. Thank you and to the audience. Thanks. <laughs>